valuations. I think it's uh, the word that is referred to the most in the community of equity market investors. I don't know if I'm right. I'm going to ask Basan Maheshwari what he thinks. Everyone's obsessed with valuations. Everybody tosses that word around valuations, valuations um, like air. Um, and yet uh, one of the ironies is that uh, the bond markets tell you more about equity than the equity markets yeah. themselves. And in the context of valuations, I'm asking this question. How does that work? So bondholder would normally be more risk averse to an equity holder in theory. Because the law says that the bondholder gets his money ahead of the equity holder. So if a company is being wound down, the bondholder gets paid first. The, bond, the bondholder does not want to participate in whatever the fortunes of the company are. It just wants its coupon, which is the interest that they get paid. So if a company is able to raise debt at a rate lower than its peers, you don't need to read any analyst reports. So if you figured out a State Bank of India, which is a sovereign guarantee, so let's keep that aside. So if you, if you figured out that an Axis Bank raises money at 10 basis points lower than maybe a Karur Vaisya Bank, it means that for some reason or the other, the stock might perform or not perform is another issue. But the financials of Axis Bank appear more satisfactory to guys who are more risk averse, more sensitive than people who are more risk taking type. So the first thing that you do is when you look at a company is figure out the rate at which they are trying to raise debt. Then if you compare it with their peer groups and if you find that the rate at which this company is raising debt is significantly lower or even slightly lower you're on the right track. If it's higher, then it's one of those cases where you have to figure out what should the company do for its fortunes to change because there is a problem somewhere where this company is having to pay higher rates on its debt when compared to its competitor. In normal parlance, we say in our community when somebody borrows and when he's in deep stress, he would borrow even up to 24% interest. interest per annum. So we say it's Diwaliya ka interest rate, hai, which means this guy is about to go bankrupt and he just wants the money at any cost. So higher the interest rates that you pay means there's something wrong in the balance sheet or somewhere. If you are paying the lowest rate of interest, yeah, on the right no track. need for any equity analysis. This company is okay. Now look at the value that you have to give for that company. Okay. So we're... Uh in the spirit of breaking down, you know, slightly complex uh, ideas and thoughts, why don't you explain what DCF is and, uh, you know, how and when it's useful? DCF was the origin of analysts towards the end of the 1929 Great Bull Run. So I say Great Bull Run because the world knows 1929 as the great year of Great Depression. But you can have a depression only after a bullish phase. You suddenly cannot fall down like this. You have to go up and then come down. I mean, you're an optimist because the, only an optimist will rebrand the big uh, bear markets no, as the I end mean, of the bull markets. No, I, on a serious no, note. No, no, I agree with you. I agree with you. Absolutely. On a serious note, I've read thousands and thousands of pages on how people normally lose everything in a bear market because that's what worries me all the time. We are in a market and this is a little bit off topic, but even though irrespective of the amount of money I can make from the market, there is some thought somewhere in my subconscious mind that if I'm not alert, someday, somewhere, sometime, I run the risk, not that I will lose it, I run the risk of losing it all. So coming back to the 1929 thing, before this markets fell from 480 to say 42, the Dow Jones, 380 to 42, stocks went up 100, 200 times. Similar names, General Motors, for example, TV, a television broadcasting company, there was a company called by the name of Radio, which used to manufacture radio. So this is also strange. Some companies who invent products, like Sun Mica, like normally you say, Xerox Karake Leao, 
It's a photocopy. Yeah. But the innovator, the original guy has got his name on that. Xerox kara ke liya. Like fridge. Fridge like there fridge. was the brand. Yeah, name. correct. You could have tried. So, yeah. uh, before that, there was a huge bull run. And when stocks go up, analysts and fund managers figure out new ways to justify buying something which they could not when prices were lower. How do I buy something which has gone up three times? I cannot. Because the traditional valuation matrix did not work at that time. So that's where DCF comes in. The DCF comes in. You say, hai, it's expensive right now. But equity is supposed to be a long term thing. Let me buy it and hold it for 10 years. And over the next 10 years, let me sit back and forecast. If I can figure out the amount of money this company would make over the next 10 years. So in 1929, I'm not thinking about the depression. I'm thinking of 10 more glorious years, years ahead of me. I'm forecasting all that, discounting it back by an inflation rate, and then coming to the current price. That's how DCF functions. So DCF basically means, what do you need 90 paise to buy now on an average? If prices were to go up by 10%, you would need almost one rupee equivalent of that one year ahead, and so on and so forth. The huge problem in a DCF format is nobody knows the weighted average cost of capital. And I can bet and tell you, not 9 out of 10, not 99 out of 100, 999 analysts out of 1000 first figure out the price that they want on their Excel and then keep tweaking that weighted average cost of capital. Because the 50 As basis point, them. yeah, 50 basis point movement up and down now. What's the problem with the WACC that we do? WACC, the weighted average cost of capital means you should be aware of the interest rates. If you're so smart at figuring out interest rates, you would made, make more money betting on bond markets than on equity markets. So that's the first part. Second part is the numerator, the cash flow. How can you figure out how much money a Vedanta would make? Even Mr. Anil Agarwal doesn't know the price of metals on the London Metal Exchange next month. Otherwise, he would not be producing metals. He would be speculating on metals. None of the commodities qualify for DCF. None of the secular growth companies qualify for DCS in terms of perfection also. So, so does any, uh, is there any scenario where DCF adds value? I mean, I don't do it. I've never done it. I don't read it. If somebody does it, I mean, I don't even see what they have done. It's as bizarre as that because just far too many assumptions. Far too many assumptions. You have to presume that a company would generate cash over the next 10 years. That's fairly easy. How much cash? What would be the capex? How much would it leave behind as free cash for its shareholders? You have to discount each year with a discount rate, which is an offshoot of inflation and cost of capital then the story doesn't end there. You have to think, after 10 years, there is something called a terminal value. What would be the terminal value of this company? Then you have to, I mean... Too many moving parts. Too many moving parts. You do a DCF without looking at a stock price. I can tell you the stock price would be 30% either ways of the DCF. Okay, while we're talking about stock prices and, uh, you know, it struck me that the longer you hold a stock, uh, the less sort of relevant or the less obsessed you are with the current valuation of the stock. Uh, I know you've been advocating time and time again, don't keep focusing on the price movements. Really, the story is not revealed by the price movements. Um, are there a few metrics that you should rather focus on instead of being obsessed with valuation? No, valuation, the role of valuation, like you rightly pointed out, diminishes with the length of the holding period. You can buy a 100 PE stock and still make a lot of money if you hold it for 40 years. But the problem in 40 years is you have to stay alive, the company has to stay alive, and the company has to promise what you thought it would deliver to you. Apart from that, the most important thing to look for an exorbitantly overvalued stock is what would make that stock cheap? The most important thing to look for an ex exorbitantly cheap stock is 
what would make that stock look expensive and sometimes cheap stocks become expensive when earnings cut themselves by half we don't want that kind of a stock so five years back most of these PSU banks had a six seven eight percent dividend yields if you remember and people used to say buy these six seven eight percent dividend yields they're not going to stay at this yield and sure they didn't because the dividends stopped coming the 4 PE stock suddenly went to 40 PE because the earnings dropped 90 percent so you when you're buying a cheap stock you have to figure out what's going to make this cheap stock expensive when you're buying an expensive stock you're going to figure out what is going to make this expensive stock cheap you cannot say expensive is bad and cheap is good cheap itself could be bad and except and expensive itself could be good it's just a function of where your analysis starts and where does it stop okay in fact you know one wonders whether to describe current valuations as abnormal a little too much uh, have they risen too sharply i mean values like beauty in the eyes of the beholder in the eyes of the beholder and the most important aspect of value is the guy who's looking at value will define value with the amount of money he has in his wallet hmm. if there is so much liquidity in the world traditional valuation metrics won't work so let's go back to the traditional theory benjamin graham's book you should buy a stock at two third of net current assets assuming that the company is going to go bankrupt how much would the equity holders be paid today if you are running a plant you cannot shut it down the labor union would come in the government would intervene i mean tatas are not allowed to shut their plants in uk and the struggle goes on they cannot even you can you can't even retrench so the book which was written in 1930 during the great depression years where people were shutting down businesses and the basic premise of that book is to buy cigar butt stocks so the cigar butt theory saying that you're walking on the street somebody smoked a cigar thrown it off just pick it up see if you can have a few puffs and then move ahead but in today's world that concept is no longer available there are no cigar but uh, cigar butts anywhere to be seen on the ground so times change valuation metrics change and with that it's very difficult to actually assign any single model to how you can value a stock now if this appears vague you would say then how do i value a stock you value it on relative basis for example if there are companies all across the world for example why isn't itc going up i might ask so the say, next thing to do is what's happening to philip morris in america if philip morris doesn't go up why should itc go up so are you saying that a great company is not always a great stock and you got to come to terms with that great company is not a great stock if you are holding it for a very short period of time when i say short it means one to three years if you if you're holding it for 10 years a great company is a great stock always as long as the company remains great again a rider <laughs> no yeah. so you know when we're saying a great company is going to be a great stock over a longer period of time that's good enough because, because the assumption is it's always going because, to be a great because company if you were 20 year holding period and the company does nothing for the first 5 years because it's because it's starting overvalued the starting point is overvalued is overvalued you make money after the 5th year that's not a problem Okay, so we've had this uh, conversation on the nuances of valuation, um, you know, getting cues from the uh, bond market. Sometimes there are very strong signals that the bond market gives you and it spares you a whole lot of equity analysis, as Basan Maheshwari was saying. Uh, but I think if you've got a long-term horizon, the less obsessed you're going to be with current day valuations and obsessions about how the price of that stock is doing. And that's something to chew on.